So welcome and, and thank you for being so faithful. Uh, for the last six weeks now, you have been part of this, this group and I am so appreciative of you being here and being part of this. And I really hope it's enriching your, your knowledge and understanding of our Book of Common Prayer. So thank you for your faithfulness. Um, so if we wanna go with the second slide, today is the Feast of All Saints. Yes, it is. And our opening prayer is the collect uh, that can be found on page 245 in our Book of Common Prayer. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. So questions on session five that we had last week on baptism. Any thoughts or questions come to mind as you... Uh, went through your week this week, this past week. Does anybody remember their baptism? <laughs> I, I think I was a baby. Oh. <laughs> you know, I know who did mine, but no, I was a, an infant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know who did mine. And, uh, you know, the priest signed the, the uh, baptismal certificate. I know it was not a public event it was always done in private after mass or something right so yeah you know it's just for the family i was baptized when i was eight years old and so i do remember mine uh, oh wow it was a, a 5 30 a.m easter vigil service oh my gosh <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and for my very non-churchy parents that was not fun <laughs> for them so how did they do the water? Did you still bend over backwards? No, I bent over forwards. And oh. so it just ran down toward my forehead over my hair. Okay. Yeah. Were there other people being baptized or just you? Just me. Wow. And I asked, I asked if I could be baptized. So that should have been a, the first clue that this was going to be my life, I guess. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And this was at 5.30 in the morning. Yep, before sunrise. They had the vigil. Okay. Yep. Wow. And all very my cool. cousins were there and everything. So, uh -huh. so nice. we had a really nice Easter breakfast and then everybody took a nap. Good. <laughs> very cool. That's neat. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the Holy Eucharist. And in our Book of Common Prayer, that's uh, in between the pages of 316 and 409. But I want to turn your attention back to page 13. That, you know, six weeks ago, we were talking about the rubrics of the church. And on page 13, we read the very first rubric there, the Holy Eucharist. Principle. The principal act of Christian worship on the Lord's Day and other major feasts, and then daily morning and evening prayer as set forth in this book, are the regular services appointed for public worship in this church. So at the very get-go, when we started this six weeks ago, we said the Holy Eucharist was the thing. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, if you would flip to... Uh, page 316, and Mother Cammy is going to talk a little bit about uh, the exhortation and the Decalogue before we get into this other stuff. Yeah. Um, so the exhortation, we don't say that often. We use it uh, at St. Timothy's only once a year, one Sunday a year. Um, does anybody know what Sunday that is? Uh, first in Lent. Yeah, very good. So let's read through it and just um, 
and just talk about what it kind of evokes for us. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second while we do this so that I can see y'all's faces. And I'm gonna ask Susan to read the first uh, paragraph. And then once you're done, I'll, I'll call on the next person, okay? If you don't wanna read, just say pass because I'm not gonna force you to do anything you don't wanna do. Beloved in the Lord, our savior Christ on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood as a sign and pledge of his love for the continual remembrance of the sacrifice of his death and for a spiritual sharing in his risen life. For in these holy mysteries, we are made one with Christ and Christ with us. We are made one body in him and members one of another. Rook. Having in mind, therefore, his great love for us and in obedience to his command, his church renders to the almighty God, our heavenly father, never ending thanks for the creation of the world, for his continued providence over us, for his love for all mankind and for the redemption of the world by our savior Christ, who took upon himself our flesh and humbled himself even to death on the cross that he might make us children of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and exalt us to everlasting life. Joanne? But if we are to share rightly in the celebration of those holy mysteries and be nourished by that <laughs> spiritual food, we must remember the dignity of that holy sacrament. I therefore call upon you to consider how St. Paul exhorts all persons to prepare themselves carefully before eating of that bread and drinking of that cup. Diane? For as the benefit is great, if with penitent hearts and living faith, we receive the holy sacrament, so is the, dangers great. It, so is the danger great if we receive it improperly, not recognizing the Lord's body. Judge yourselves, therefore, lest us be judged by the Lord. Nancy? Examine your lives and conduct by the rule of God's commandments that you may perceive wherein you have offended in what you have done or left undone, whether in thought, word, or deed, and acknowledge your sins before Almighty God with full purpose of amendment of life, being ready to make restitution for all injuries and wrongs done by you to others and also being ready to forgive those who have offended you in order that you yourselves may be forgiven. And then being reconciled with one another, come to the banquet of that most heavenly food. Jeff? And if in your preparation, you need help and counsel, then go and open your grief to a discreet and understanding priest and confess your sins that you may receive the benefit of absolution and spiritual counsel and advice to the removal of scruple and doubt, the assurance of pardon and the strengthening of your faith. To Christ our Lord who loves us and washed us in his own blood and made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father, to whom be glory in the church evermore. Through him, let us offer continually the sacrifice of praise which is our bounden duty and service. And with faith in him, come boldly before the throne of grace and humbly confess our sins to almighty God. I mean, we don't read the entire thing, do we? Oh yeah. We do, I tell you. Hmm? And what day did you, do you do that? We do it on the first Sunday of Lent. And then for the next four Sundays of Lent, we, we say the Decalogue, which is, uh, which is the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so what do you what do you think about this exhortation? What well, does it say? It? To you? Who 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 wrote the exhortation? Thomas Cranmer. Yeah, probably. He likes commas. <laughs> <laughs> Long sentences, like Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those run-on sentences. Well, yeah. someday when you meet him, Susan, you can tell him all about it. That's right. <laughs> it's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is this why Catholics do confession before communion? 
It's why we do confession before communion too. Yes. We, we've ne the Episcopal Church has never pushed it as much, have they? I don't know if ever. We, we do remove that uh, shroud of guilt a bit. Um, being people who believe in uh, salvation by grace alone um, kind of takes some of the pressure off of us. So we do take that uh, off of ourselves a bit. Uh, we do encourage confession. Uh, we, it's one of the sacraments still is reconciliation of a penitent, which I think we'll probably talk about here in a week or two. Yeah, next and, week or two. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so it is, it's still one of the sacraments. I, the only time I've ever confessed in my life was the week before my ordination, my ordination to the priesthood. I did confession with a Lutheran pastor because the Episcopal church is small. So, <laughs> so, hmm. um, yeah, I, I recommend it. It's it's a really powerful experience to go through. If you've never done it, I'm sure as a, as former Catholics, those of you who are, you know what it is to sit in a confessional, which we don't right. do that. It's it's a face to face, very just personal conversation with, and and there's a there's structure to it. If you follow the reconciliation of a penitent, yeah, it's, it is. It's very powerful. It's a mm -hmm. powerful experience. But it is, it is good, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in this uh, session, but the reason we confess is to bring ourselves back into right relationship with God, and the reason we share the peace with one another is to bring ourselves back into right relationship with one another so that we can, without reservation, approach the, the altar and receive communion. And so that's what this is asking us to do. It's, a, it's an exhortation to uh, examine yourself and it says, what does it say? Um, I have to look at it. Um, if with penitent hearts and living faith, we receive the holy sacrament. Uh, so as the benefit is great, so is the danger great. Because if we receive it improperly, not recognizing the Lord's body, we need to judge ourselves lest we be judged by the Lord. So it's, it's calling us to examine ourselves, to look at our relationships, not only with each other, but with God, and then come forward for communion. It's, it's highlighting the, the real seriousness of what we do every Sunday. And so, it, yeah, how does that, what does that do for you? How does that make you feel? <laughs> Yeah, I, I have the same question as Nancy because um, you know I grew up Catholic, mm -hmm. and the and you were supposed to receive the sacrament of confession at a minimum once a year, mm -hmm. and so and usually I think it was right before Easter that that was the most important time to that you had to be pure of heart or whatever, and they would even have each church would have guest priests come in and they had all these areas set up so they would have the confession you know, and. Um, that's why I noticed that was like one of the big things that was different when I switched over to be an Episcopalian, that it's more of a private type of thing. Yeah. And I remember, I think I asked Jack, you know, who was the, the rector at the time. And he said, oh, if you want to do it, you know, we can do it. But it just wasn't as important. But it was, I mean, it's important, but it doesn't have to be shared with another person, that it can be done privately. Yeah. And it should be yeah. done. I mean, it still yeah. should be done, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and unfortunately, when you were a kid, it, it confession became really rote. I mean, it's like <laughs> because you had to do it so much. I think it lost some of its importance. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to talk about postcard postcard confessions. You know, you write it right. You know, ahead of time, you bunch of kids. You know, waiting to do it. You know, you write down, okay, I did this, I did this, and then you go and say, I did this and did this, and. I don't, you know, it's just, um, it was so hounded at you. It, it just kind of lost some of its meaning you know, mm -hmm. as kids, as, you know, as a younger kid, when I got older, you know, it meant more, but. Um, it it know, became disciplinary. The, yeah, it was the, the process was like, disciplinary oh and punishment. Oh, uh, yeah, where the like, Episcopal Church sees it as freeing and absolving and right. welcoming yeah. back. Right. Um, and, and it's not a punishment. 
no. And it was, you know, it's like, oh, you, you better do this. You know, I mean, sometimes you thought, you know, maybe the floor was going to go up and up and up and you were going to go to hell directly. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh my God. And then it got to the point where it was just like, okay, nothing's happened. Then, you know, I'm just going to say my routine, you know, postcard, okay. postcard, you know, confession, which is sad. Um, I think it loses some, you know, for some of us at, at a young age, because, you know, I, when I was in college, you know, okay, you know, I would occasionally go to church and, you know, um, you know, and then as I got to be older, you know, it became more important, you know, I kind of like, where I went away, I came back, um, you know, and then you take, I mean, took things more seriously, um, but which is too bad. Yeah, I, I remember specifically, I was probably uh, 10, 11, whatever, and Father Francis Cahill uh, was the priest. And, you know, you, you started out with, it's been, you know, six weeks, or it's been three months, or it's been whatever, since my last confession. And so, you know, whatever it was, he goes, all right, stop right there. He goes, how often do you pay your electric bill? And I go, I don't pay an electric bill. My dad pays the electric bill. Well, how often does he pay it? And I go, I don't know, I guess every month. Well, you should be coming to confession every month. And I mean, he just called me out. And it's like, I'm done with this. I am done with this, you know? Yeah, it was pretty bad. We had to go every week or every two weeks. We got well, yeah, that was oh, did you? Like, yeah, I went to a Catholic month? grade school and yeah. we had to go on the first Friday it's... of every month. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and then I mean when you're in first and second grade, I mean I mean, you had to think about like what did you do? You know, I was mean to my sister, right? I lied to right. my parents. And I then didn't you had to say how many my mother times, and, and then you just made up a mother. number because you you didn't like keep track of how many times you did things. I mean, right. it was it was I, mean, I look back, I laugh about it, but I mean, um, I mean, you did feel like you were gonna be struck down by God if you really didn't, you know, like what did I forget, you know? Yeah. Um yeah. yeah, it was different. <laughs> different, yeah. different yeah. We, should pr- we should probably move on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we all have stories. Right, right. Yeah, but I, I mean, the point is of the exhortation, um, you know, we believe that you don't need an intercessor on your behalf to confess your sins. You can do that and receive God's forgiveness and blessing on your own. Mm-hmm. But what it says, if in your preparation, you need help and counsel, then go and open your grief to a discreet and understanding priest and then con- and confess your sins. If you are feeling so overwhelmed by guilt and your sin or whatever, then you come and you find me, you go, you find Mother Liz, here in a couple months, you can go and find Father Jeff and you can, and we can walk you through that sacrament, but you don't need us to intercede on your behalf because you have a personal relationship a personal relationship with God and you can receive forgiveness and reconciliation on your own. That's the point. Mm-hmm. We're here. And like I said, it, it can be an extremely moving thing to go through with the priest, but it's not necessary to, for us to do something that you can do yourself. But if you do, you know, you receive, you receive a blessing, you receive a physical blessing from a priest Mm-hmm. And that's where the sacrament lives, is yeah. in that reconciliation with, with the priest, with God, and with yourself. So, and, and this exhortation could be a good practice, uh, getting to church a couple minutes early, just sitting there in the pew, reading through this and saying, am I right? Am I in good relationship with God to now meet Christ on the altar and receive the body and blood? Mm-hmm. You know, just... Yeah. So it could yeah, be a routine that you do. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. I used to do that when I was a Catholic, and now yeah. we tend to be too social. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing too. Yeah. And we well, don't we have prayer books. books. We need to put the prayer books back in the pews. So that'll yeah. be a good reason to do it. I'll, I'll make sure it happens. Yeah. I need, I need to leave for a few minutes to call this client about the real estate deal we wrote last night, but I'll be back. All right. 
And then do you want to talk about the Decalogue? Oh, uh, the Decalogue is the Ten Commandments, and we use that um, every other Sunday in Lent after we do the exhortation. So if, okay. you need, if you need reminder of what those are, there they are. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, the Holy Eucharist, it's the celebration uh, that the church acts most fully is the body of Christ, the people of God. Now, like baptism, the Eucharist is rooted and grounded in the Paschal mystery and find its fullest context in the great vigil of Easter. And yet every Lord's day is a celebration of the resurrection. And it is in the Eucharist, which gives us the Paschal character to our Sundays. For the church proclaims and lives out the Paschal mystery of Jesus dying and rising. Easter, the Lord's day, and the celebration of the Eucharist are inextricably bound together. So a Sunday and Easter are always the same. Um, the Eucharist is not the action of one person. It's the action of the body of Christ, the head, and all the members. God in Christ is the principal actor. And we all in our various ministries, whether that be bishop, priest, deacon, or lay, have our roles to play in the celebration of the Eucharist. Now, the multiplicity of ministers and of the liturgical roles is theologically significant. It signifies the unity in the body of Christ, in the diversity of the gifts and ministries that we all share. By the late fourth century, the basic structure of the Eucharist was in place, one which has endured to today, is composed of two interrelated parts, which our prayer book calls the Word of God, and that is on page 323 or 355, and the second part, the Holy Communion, which begins on 333 and 361. And there's kind of a five-fold sequence of what uh, constitutes our liturgy. There's first gathering of God's people, and then proclaiming and receiving the word of God. We offer prayers of the people. We celebrate the Lord's table. And then we go out as God's people into the world. So next slide. Uh, the prayer book contains two forms of the Holy Eucharist. Just like our daily offices, write one in the Elizabethan language and write two in a more contemporary language. The structure of the two rites is the same, and there are no real theological differences. It's only the, the words or the language. The celebration of the word of God begins what is sometimes called an entrance rite. The gathering song, whether it's a hymn or a psalm or an anthem, is more than simply incidental music to cover the entrance of the liturgical ministers. Singing together is a means of involving and unifying the congregation. And then we pray the colic for purity, and that's on page 355. It's a preparatory prayer of the presider and the people that calls upon God who knows the condition of our inner beings and to cleanse our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love God and worthily magnify God's holy name. This prayer, this colic for purity has been used at the opening of Anglican Eucharist since 1549. 1549, over 500, almost 500 years, 600 years, 550 years, using that same prayer. 
Uh, the Eucharist continues with the song of praise. Usually it's the Gloria. And then uh, it concludes with the collect of the day, which collects the prayers of the assembly. And we talked about collects a few weeks ago, and every Sunday or every feast day has its own particular collect. Uh, and it begins with the ancient greeting of the Lord be with you. And it brings people into dialogue with the person who is presiding. The let us pray allows the congregation to offer their own prayers, or at least briefly. Uh, scripture readings are indicated, uh, we talked about a few weeks ago in the lectionary, way in the back of our prayer book, uh, between 888 and 932. And it follows that three-year cycle. It was first introduced by the Roman Catholic Church after the Second Vatican Council. In the 1970s, the Episcopal Church, along with other major North American Protestant churches, adapted or adopted the Roman lectionary. There are three scripture passages used each Sunday, an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading or epistle, and a gospel. And then there is a psalm that's recited or sung after that first Old Testament reading. Our gospel holds a place of honor as the final reading. It's read by the deacon or the chief liturgical assistant from the pulpit or lectern or in the midst of the congregation. The gospel procession, carrying the book to the place where the gospel will be read, has often been seen as symbolic of the word of God coming to the people. It is dramatic and it calls attention to the gospel reading and the honor paid to the gospel as the word of God. And all of us participating, standing to hear the gospel honors the reality behind what is heard. So it is always an ordained individual that would read the gospel. The lay folks participating can read the Old and New Testaments, but it always has to be someone that's been ordained to read the gospel. That's how uh, important we, we see the gospel. Um, our gospel is immediately followed by a sermon. The sermon uh, expands on the gospel. Uh, sermons are not inspirational talks, but it's the breaking open of the word of God so that God's people may be fed with it. Sermons are not an interpretation of the liturgy. I'm sorry. Sermons are not an interruption of the liturgy, but they're an integral part. It's clearly intended to be a part of every Sunday and Holy Day Eucharist. There needs to be a sermon. Uh, the movement from the first part of the liturgy has been primarily from God to humankind through Christ. The word is read in the scripture and proclaimed in the sermon. And our response is exemplified by the corporate recitation of the Nicene Creed, our official ecumenical statement of the faith of the universal church that was accepted by the consuls of Nicaea and Constantinople back in the fourth century. The creed is the most formal theology statement in the liturgy, and it proclaims our most basic beliefs about God. After the creed, the deacon leads the prayers of the people. Uh, and generally, we also include the lay uh, folks to offer those prayers as well. Corporate prayer is itself a most fitting faith response to the proclamation of the word. The prayers of the people are a principal occasion for the common prayer of the people of God. They are the people's prayers, and the leader must allow others in the assembly to offer their own petitions, intercessions, and thanksgivings. The prayer book permits the utmost flexibility in the prayers, requiring only that certain basic topics encompassing the concerns of the church, the nation, and the world 
as well as those of the local community be included. So there is some standards as to what we include in the prayers of the people that they should always be included. And you can see they list those in the Book of Common Prayer. And you can see that on page 359. It yeah. doesn't have just a standard prayers of the people. That's why there are options in the prayer book. And right. there's also just the option that you can you can write your own. Uh, I had to do that as a as an assignment in seminary was to write my own prayers of the people. Mm -hmm. um, and there are forms for that and that tells you all that in the rubrics. Sure. But there you can see on 359, we pray for the universal church, its members and its mission. We pray for our nation and all in authority. We pray for the welfare of the world, the concerns of our local community, for those who suffer and those who are in any trouble. And we pray for the departed. Um, the confession of sin is the concluding act of the prayers of the people. Self-examination and confession to God prepares us for communion. We verbalize our private personal confession and the recognition of our participation in our corporate sinfulness of society, of which we all are a part. We acknowledge our own individual sin as well as our solidarity in the corporate sinfulness, things done on our behalf. We pray that Christ will have mercy on us and forgive us. And this is what the presider then declares in the absolution, forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a prayer that is said, but it's a declaration of God's forgiveness to all who are repentant and believe the gospel. It is the duty and the responsibility of the bishop or priest who is presiding to declare that absolution for us. Uh, the exchange of peace is the bridge between the liturgy of the word of God and that of Holy Communion. We greet one another in peace. And it reflects on the teachings from Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So just as Mother Cammy said a few minutes ago, we are in right relationship with each other. And then we should approach the table, uh, but we need to be in right relationship first. Uh, the Holy Communion begins with preparing the bread and wine, placing them on the altar. It's called the offertory. The representatives of the congregation, uh, when there isn't COVID going on, bring the people's offerings of bread and wine and money and other gifts to the deacon or celebrant. It's intended to symbolize the people's offerings of their whole lives. And the deacon or presided then prepares the table with the bread and the cup of wine. So I'm assuming uh, prior to, to COVID that uh, you also had the bread and wine brought up to the altar, someone right. from the congregation, yeah. yeah. So when the bread and wine have been placed upon the altar, the presider begins the Eucharistic prayer, or sometimes referred to as the Great Thanksgiving. The dialogue begins with the traditional greeting, the Lord be with you. And then lift up your hearts. And that's an invitation to join in this Eucharistic offering. In the fourth century, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem commented, for at that most often off, awesome moment, we must indeed raise our hearts high to God, not keeping them intent on the earth and on earthly matters. So the priest is virtually commanding you at that moment to lay aside all the cares of your life, your domestic worries, and to keep your heart in heaven on God who loves humankind. Lift up your hearts. Let earthly things stay, but you, you move above 
And that's a wonderful invitation. Um, there are eight alternative Eucharistic prayers that are included in our Book of Common Prayer. Uh, there's two in Rite 1, and there's four in Rite 2, and there's two in an order for celebrating the Holy Eucharist. And then Enriching Our Worship 1, which is another contemporary addition to our prayer book, provides five additional Eucharistic prayers. And most have a common structure, which was adopted by the first American prayer book in 1789 that came from the Scottish non-jurors. No single Eucharistic prayer can say everything. Each one has its own emphasis, but collectively the prayers present a balanced picture of Eucharistic theology. And an entire study of the Eucharistic prayers could be made regarding their diversity and their richness. So that's where from time to time, uh, you know, we alternate just so we don't get in such a routine that we kind of take it for granted because uh, they're all beautiful in their own richness of, of the words that are used in those. We have been using uh, Eucharistic prayer B for mm -hmm. quite some time, but mm -hmm. this Sunday when we observe the Feast of All Saints, we will use Eucharistic prayer D, which mm -hmm. actually uh, kind of changes the order of service a little bit. It cuts out the prayers of the people and puts them in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer. And so uh, if you're coming to 1045, especially on Sunday, listen for that because it, it will sound, it will probably be something that you've heard before, actually most certainly something you've heard before, um, but won't Jesus. feel as familiar as what we've been using. So. Gee, it's the longest also, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's my favorite, if you're asking, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, at some point in this prayer, this Eucharistic prayer, the people join with the angels and saints in the angelic hymn of the Sanctus, giving voice to every creature under heaven. The Sanctus includes the Benedictus qui venit, blessed is the one who comes, a verse from Psalm 118. And it is found in all four of the gospels as Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Bread and wine are offered to God in Christ's name so that they may become what Christ has declared them to be, his body and his blood. Our food and drink for the new life we now have through him. The priest invokes the Holy Spirit in what's called the epiclesis. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And then we pray, sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And the final element, you know, the, the epiclesis is when the priest is uh, holding their hands over the, the bread and the cup, or in some way touching them, and then making the sign of the cross over them, you know, invoking the Holy Spirit to be present. Uh, that's when, that's when in our faith, in our theology, that bread and that wine is now becomes Christ's body and blood. Uh, the final element of the Eucharistic prayer is the closing doxology, which offers the prayers of the church to the Father, through the Son, and the unity of the Holy Spirit. The final amen from the congregation is the uh, assent of the people of God in whose name the presider has given thanks. So that's when the priest will hold up the bread and the cup and through him, with him, and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. People say amen. Uh, the Lord's Prayer forms the natural climax of our thanksgiving for Christ's self-offering. 
Its corporate recitation binds us together in the celebration, and it expresses our unity with one another in Christ. If I have a question um, about the uses of A, B, C, and D, yeah. um, the, you know, first thing is, why don't we use C more? Because it's my favorite. Um, but how is it? <laughs> well, did we you... didn't know that, but we'll start using it more. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love the fragile earth, my our island home. I, I, I know, I, I know. I love that phrase, but how how is it determined which one we use? I think it's it's the choice of the presider, right, Cami? So generally, they they follow. Some Eucharistic prayers are more appropriate for the season that you're in. So um, I like I like. Eucharistic prayer C for like Easter, Easter season. Uh, it, first of all, it's more participatory. It's more cosmic, like you like you pointed out, Susan. Um, and it just it brings in some of those elements that are more appropriate for Easter season. Uh, Eucharistic prayer A and prayer B are going to be your bread and butter that you're going to hear most of the year. I think it's because they're they're more formulaic as to uh, what we're talking about in terms of. Christ being, um, let me go, let me go to the, so we're using B right now. It, it's more formulaic in how it lays out Christ's uh, role in our salvation. So um, uh, in the last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary to be the savior and redeemer of the world. It just, it moves through that narrative a little bit faster and easier than say C or D, like Brooke pointed out, D is longer. And that's more appropriate for use on like major feast days, major saints days, um, just because it's a little bit, it's a lot more uh, involved, I guess. And so it just depends. Um, I think, I don't know what we're going to in Lent, maybe back to A, but, or I'm sorry, Advent. Um, but, we try to switch it up. We try to do with them all in, in the, over the course of the year. Uh, obviously COVID has kind of just asked us to be as simple as possible, but um, yeah, generally we try to hit them all. Isn't D, isn't D also appropriate for say Monday, Thursday? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it talks more about the sacrifice. It talks more about the death um, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. When the hour had come. Mm -hmm. Then. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank, that's, yeah, yeah. that's helpful. And, and again, each one of them has specific sentences or thoughts that are just so beautiful. And uh, so they're all unique and they're all special. But uh, yeah, we all tend to have a favorite, I think, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the, uh, we talked about the Lord's Prayer, slide 10. Uh, in the scriptural accounts of the Last Supper, Jesus follows the Jewish tradition of breaking and sharing bread over which a blessing has been said. So Christians have been seen, have seen the breaking of the bread as a symbol of breaking the Lord's body on the cross and their own need to be broken in order to both share in the life of Christ and with others. Eating the bread, drinking the wine is the effective sign of our participation in Christ's sacrifice. Communion follows an ancient invitation, the gifts of God or the people of God. People come forward to receive the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, and the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. And then uh, we conclude with the simple post-communion prayer, and then dismissal. The church which is gathered to make Eucharist is now then sent out to be the body of Christ into the world, to bear witness to Jesus and the resurrection. So the dismissal is a call to mission, 
a relationship between our liturgy and our Christian living. And that, in a nutshell, uh, pulls together what Eucharist is all about. And we didn't look at specific pages, but you know, you may want to go back and look through and see the various parts and read some of the rubrics that go with some of that. Uh, but other thoughts or comments, questions? You what, know, what, what didn't we cover? Going through the baptism last week and Eucharist tonight, it just reinforces a much deeper understanding of what we are doing and why mm -hmm. we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. It's been very helpful. Good. I, I, want, I want to point out the symbolism uh, that's in the, the church name at St. Timothy's. When you first walk in, there is the baptismal font. That Where's is the that? beginning. That is the initiation yep. into Christ's family, the church. And the symbolism of that stone, that intense, heavy rock that is sitting there. I mean, it is planted there. Not to be moved. It's permanent, really. Mm -hmm. it, it, it designates strength. And it's right there. And if you look, when you come in, there's, there's the floor, the, the, the wood is laid out, and there's a circle around it. Kind of keeping that all together so that we can gather around it. And then if you'll notice the design of the floor the wood in the floor then goes straight forward up to the altar. It is taking your eye and your whole movement from that font to the table. Wow. And then again, a circle around that altar that we all can gather. And somebody was brilliant that designed that. I mean, that is an amazing feature that connects baptism and Eucharist through, through that little aisle way. And it, it, it means so much to me. It's, it's amazing. Um, and, and that's who we are. We start out with baptism, but we directly go forward uh, to Eucharist. Yeah, so notice that when you come to church the next time. I think I find it very powerful. It really is saying something that that uh, it's just very subtle, but mm -hmm. uh, it's there. Symbolism. Yeah, symbolism. Now, does the Episcopal Church have a first communion like we had when we were kids where you, you're eight and you have your first communion and then you can have communion there? No. No. Uh, okay. Baptism is your initiation into okay. communion, into the communion of the it people. Used to be, it used to be confirmation. Huh? Used to be confirmation. Oh. I received mine the Sunday after I was confirmed. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Years ago when we um, were, uh, on, I was on a search committee and we called a new rector and we were interviewing the candidate we ended up choosing. Um, but, we, you know, we had some older people on the search team, and one man in particular just did not think the little kids should get communion. They shouldn't get communion until they know what it stands for, and he was, he, he was very outspoken about it, and he asked the candidate, he said, well, what do you think? You really think these kids, you know, they're just chewing on the host, and, and the candidate thought for a moment, and he said, you know, they just don't know what it's about, and uh, or how important it is. And the candidate thought a minute and he said, you know, sometimes I wonder about what it's all about and how important it is. And he said, I wouldn't invite somebody to my home in a mealtime and not give them food with mm -hmm. the whole family. And I just, I thought that was so powerful. Wow. Um, yeah. Because I love seeing the little ones. They just have their own style and they, 
dance up and they march up and some are very holy and some are not and but they're just part of it and that's so yeah. important and kids take mm. you know i think and i i love that answer is that i wouldn't invite somebody to my home for dinner and then not feed them um you know we as adults often take for granted stepping up to that table Sometimes we don't think about what it is that we're receiving. Sometimes we're not worthy. Never are we worthy of receiving what we're being offered. But the point is, is that it's freely given. Mm -hmm. And with kids, kids take a lot less convincing that this is what this is that I'm putting in your hand than adults do. Mm -hmm. Kids believe so mm -hmm. much easier. It's not until they get older and start asking questions and start being influenced by people that, that they start wondering if what they're getting is is really what they're being offered. And so um, I think kids are probably the the most worthy people who come to the table. Yeah. They're the most yeah. innocent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, up to the parents too. Um, you know, I I think it's left open that if the parents don't want their children when they're very young for whatever reason, maybe they feel that they're not ready you know it's up to the parents so um but usually you know the child is reaching out as, as you're coming around and and i you know i love being in a eucharistic minister i hope we get invited back on the altar someday mm -hmm. but i just love the kids who yeah. um you know would just take it with gusto and, yeah but, yeah but jo joanne and diane and i being raised Roman Catholic, I mean, when we were, I guess, maybe in third grade, uh, went through catechism instruction for a year uh, and waited for that day in during the Easter season in May, probably, uh, right. and got dressed up in our suits and our white dresses and Those in our veils. Our veils. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. It was quite a production. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we're anticipating this great and wonderful and delicious bread and it's like oh my god there's not much to this <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah and no wine yeah. we didn't no wine. wine no there was never wine at that time no yeah. no i will no. tell you those clay chalices that we use uh at nine o'clock um they have been in that cupboard with that with that very uh fragrant oil for so long that any wine oh. that it, all I taste is frankincense. Oh, I'll tell you what of Christ does not taste good at nine o'clock. It is oh. a rough one. Wow. Rough. Uh, it's a rough one. Academy. Yeah. Uh, are, are there any plans in the future to get back to Eucharistic visitors uh, going to homes? Yeah, I think that's probably going to happen so soon. Um, and it'll be at the, you know, willingness of the person who's going and the willingness of the person who's receiving, um, you know, how they want to set that up in terms of wearing masks and um, if they want to share a cup. Like I did a home visit recently and both people in Tinkton, in, yeah, in Tinkton, and then I consumed the wine. So it, I mean, and we had agreed upon that, that was, that was agreeable huh. for the three of us. And so it's going to be uh yes with extra communication that that's a wonderful ministry it really is yeah and absolutely ready to go so yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a couple other little things i wanted to point out on page 406 seven, eight, nine. Yeah. uh additional directions or additional rubrics that go along with the the eucharist um, and Mother Cammy, if you wanted to point out a couple things. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, this is mostly just going to tell you, you know, it's desirable that the readings are read from a lectern. The gospel can also be read from the lectern, but the gospel can also be read from the, you know, amidst the people. Um, it will also, you know, tell you opportunity is always to be given to every communicant to receive consecrated bread and wine separately. Obviously, right now, in our context, we're not doing that. Um, 
but and so then it goes on it says but it can it what does it say but the sacrament may be received in both kinds simultaneously uh, but the you get the full benefit of the sacrament in just one form as well um some of my uh, what we were talking about here is largely what we we're talking about if you look on page 409 under disciplinary rubrics i never knew that i was just skimming through it yeah yeah oh. um if the priest knows that a person who is living a notoriously evil life intends to come to communion the priest shall speak to that person privately and tell them huh. that they may not come to the holy table until they have given clear proof of repentance and amendment of life. It's it's yeah. fun to talk about, but not so funny when you have to put it into practice. I uh -huh. have not had to do that personally, but I I when I was a youth minister before I went to seminary, we had to have a conversation with someone. Um, in our congregation and let them know that they were not going to be receiving communion until they they did confession and we could see that they were uh seeking counseling for the very troubling thing that they were dealing with um so it was interesting um well and it says you have to notify the bishop. why is that because Oftentimes when people get upset with the priest, they'll go straight to the bishop's office and right, say, right. all the bishop wants is heads up so that they mm -hmm. can back you up as the priest who's making the decision. That's all we have. Ad, we have mm -hmm. Advent coming very soon. And I imagine that we will do the great litany on the first Sunday of Advent. Yes. We, we do it Advent. Yes. Or yes. Do it Lent. I think Advent. Yes. Yep. Something, yeah, we're, we'll be planning that tomorrow. I have a feeling at staff meeting. So, yeah. So, I recommend that you read through these extra rubrics. It's just, they're interesting. Um, and it just shows how much flexibility we have with this book. Uh, while we do have prescribed liturgy, there is always room for compromise and, um, and, and room for us to be our created human people. So, yeah, and also, you know, it just tells you where you can put more music and, and all. So read through them. Yeah. I think they're interesting. Good. Any other questions? So for next week, uh, we're going to do what we call the pastoral offices. Um, and they begin on page 412. And we'll go through... Um, to 467, 412 to 467. So take a look at those pages this coming week. And then next week we'll gather and uh, go through those. So that includes confirmation, uh, marriage, birth or adoption of a child, reconciliation, which we talked about a little bit tonight, and uh, some uh, ministry to the sick. So, uh, and Mother Cammy can pray us out. And then we thought we would uh, offer ev evening prayer if you would like to stay over and uh, participate in that. Mm -hmm. So the dean and president of my seminary wrote a poem. It's called A Hymn for the Feast of All Saints. And so I'd like to read that as, as our prayer for tonight. Who has cast the canopy and woven in the light? Who has joined the break of sky along the seam of sea? Who has spun the days with silk, whirled the nights as pitch? Who has drawn the crimson through, the tro through troubled in the blue? Who has shaken out the tent and staked it in the ground? Who has rinsed the silver cloud, perfumed the grass with balm? Who has washed the robes with soap? and hung them in the sun? Who has wound the shattered up, bound the sutures neat? Who has knit your lives in one, a net of shimmering threads? Who has laced the living with the holy dead? Who has fastened up the gown around the infant's chin? Who is weaving even now? Who is blessing all? Amen. 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 Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank yep. you. So if you would like to stay, uh, 
certainly love to have you to do evening prayer. Uh, but if you've got other commitments, have a good evening. Sleep well. Waiting.